Bible. Open it up today to Proverbs chapter 14, and we will pick up our study in verse 1. But let's pray first, as we always do. Lord God, we pray that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that we may live a life that is pleasing to you, glorifying to you, bearing fruit in every good work, and always increasing in the knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, chapter 14 of Proverbs, verse 1, it says, A wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands the foolish one tears her down. A wise and respectable and godly wife will care for her family and do her part around the house. And if she does that, her household will be blessed. A foolish woman is one who neglects her husband and neglects her children. And then she sits back and wonders why the whole thing is falling apart and why her marriage why her marriage is shot and why her children are disrespectful. Verse two He whose walk is upright fears the Lord, but he whose ways are devious despises him. If you fear the Lord, you will walk in an upright manner. If you despise the Lord, well, then your ways are going to be devious. That is what the Bible says. In other words, our conduct reflects our attitude toward God. If we know that God is with us, if we know that He is watching if we respect Him and we want to please Him, then we will live a righteous life. Our conduct reflects our attitude toward God. Someone who sins, at that moment that they are sinning, they do not care one bit about God's feelings or about what God may want. Verse 3. A fool's talk brings a rod to his back. But the lips of the wise protect them. A fool will get a beating for the things that he says. And sometimes it's a literal beating and sometimes it's other forms of trouble that he gets because of the foolish, stupid, sinful things that he says. But the person who thinks before he talks will be preserved from that type of trouble. Look at verse 4. Where there, where there are no oxen, the manger is empty. But from the strength of an ox comes an abundant harvest. Now, if you have a barn, you can keep that barn nice and clean. If you don't have any animals in there, if you don't have an ox in that barn, or a horse, or cows, or whatever, you can keep that barn spick and span. I mean, you can clean it up. You can sweep it up. No hay laying around there. No straw laying around there. No manure laying around there. You just sweep it up. You can paint it. You can live inside that thing which smells so fresh and clean if you don't have an ox. Of course, if you don't have an ox and you won't have a crop either back in these days because an ox did the work of a tractor. So yeah, you could keep it nice and clean but you wouldn't have a crop and you wouldn't have anything to eat. And the lesson is this. Doing something positive often results in a mess. I mean, when you work hard, your hands get dirty. Your kitchen gets dirty. Your workshop gets dirty. Your dishes get dirty. Your kettles get dirty. Your tools get dirty. They maybe even get scratched up and maybe even break. You make a mess when you do something positive. That's just the way it goes. But the rewards of work, more than more than make up for the mess that it causes. That's the point of verse 4. Look at verse 5. A truthful witness does not deceive, but a false witness pours out lies. Nothing worse than a guilty conscience. And lying 
or deceiving, like any other sin, will bring that guilty conscience. You have to be very careful to tell the truth at all times. Verse 6, the mocker seeks wisdom and finds none. And when it's talking about the mocker, it's talking about about somebody who mocks truth, who mocks God, who mocks God's word. They may seek wisdom, but they're not going to find any because they've already rejected wisdom. They've already rejected truth. Someone who rejects God and God's word can never find wisdom. It's impossible because they've already rejected it. It would be as if you went to your freezer and you got rid of all your ice cream. Every drop of ice cream, you threw it down the garbage disposal. And then you said, I threw away my, gar- my, my ice cream, so now I'm going to look for ice cream because I want ice cream. Well, you're not going to find ice cream because you've already rejected your ice cream and thrown it down the garbage disposal. And that's the way it is with truth. If you reject truth, you're not going to find wisdom. If you reject God, you're not going to find wisdom. If you're going to reject God's truth, the only thing you are going to find are lies. People who reject God's word spend their life chasing nonsense and believing nonsense because they've already rejected the truth. Verse 6. The mocker seeks wisdom and finds none, but knowledge comes easily to the discerning. That is, knowledge comes easily to those who want to know the truth. Knowledge comes easily to the discerning. In other words, if you want to please God, and you really want truth, no matter what that truth may be, no matter how that truth may set with you, if you really want to please God, if you really want truth, then you will recognize truth when you hear it. Jesus said this in the Gospel of John. I'll paraphrase, but he said, a willingness to obey truth will help you to discern truth. Verse 7. Stay away from a foolish man, for you will not find knowledge on his lips. Stay away from a foolish man. And remember what a foolish man is in the eyes of God. is somebody who is ungodly, doesn't care about God, doesn't, doesn't care about the Word of God, rejects the truth. God says, stay away from a foolish man like that. You should not be a friend of a fool, of somebody who is, who is ungodly. You should not even be around them. And thus it is to tell them about Christ and speak some truth. But you don't want to hang around a foolish person like that. God says it right here. Stay away. You're not going to gain anything positive from being around somebody like that anyway. All that's going to happen is your the, his foolishness is going to start to rub off on you. Bad company corrupts good morals, the Bible says. Eight. The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways. But the folly of fools is deception. The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways. A godly person and an ungodly person will define wisdom by two different definitions. A godly, prudent person defines wisdom like this. Honesty, obedience to God, honorable. That's how a a godly person defines wisdom. On the other hand, a fool defines wisdom as being dishonest. Well, you know, if I'm dishonest, I'll, I'll get this extra few bucks here. That, that'll make me wise. See, that makes me wise. Or a fool defines wisdom as being deceiving. If I deceive this person, oh boy, I am really wise if I get away with deceiving this person because then I'm going to get this or that. Or a fool defines wisdom as being self-serving. I'm going to have it my way. I am wise because I'm going to have things my way. God says No. Not at all. The foolish wisdom, so-called, of fools, he says in the last part of this verse, is a deception. It's not wise at all. They have bought a lie, they are living a lie, and they will suffer for that lie in the long run. Verse 9. Fools mock at making amends for sin, but goodwill is found among the upright. You've got to be a fool, says God, if you mock at making amends for your sins because you are accountable for your sins. Sin promises to satisfy 
our desires. Sin promises good, but in the end, sin delivers a sting. People think that they can continue in their sin and it's going to be okay. But if they don't repent, well, they're going to be shut out from heaven. They're going to be shut out from God. They're going to be shut out from everything that is good forever and ever, and they will be banished to hell. God will punish them for their sin. That's why you have got to be a fool, says God, if you don't make amends for your sin. We all need to make amends for our sin before God. Said that wrong. We all need to look to Jesus. We all need to have Jesus make amends for our sin by His death on the cross and by receiving Him into our lives as Lord and Savior. We are fools if we don't do that. Ten. Each heart knows its own bitterness and no one else can share its joy. Each heart knows its own bitterness and no one else can share its joy. You can share your sorrows and your joys with other people. To a certain point you can do that, but only partially. There are certain things, both good and bad, that are locked up inside of you that you can't share with anybody because even if you had the words to express it, they probably wouldn't understand anyway. There are certain things locked up in every single one of us, some things good, some things bad, that we have to keep to ourselves. That we have to, I don't know, there are joys and sorrows that you and Christ, if you know Jesus, must endure together or must enjoy together. 11. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. Notice that. Notice how the wicked in this verse have a house and the upright only have a tent. But notice something else. Notice also that the wicked can't enjoy their house because it is destroyed. The point is this. God's lesson for us in this verse is this. You're better off and you'll have more joy if you obey God than if you don't obey God. And even if you don't, even if you don't have as much as your wicked neighbor has materially, you will enjoy your little more than he will enjoy his much because you have God verse 12 there is a way that seems right to a man but in the end it leads to death and the way that seems right to a man when it comes to salvation is to earn their way to heaven is to work their way to heaven by having their good works outweigh their bad works or by going to church whenever the doors are open or taking communion or being baptized or doing some religious or charitable work. That is the way that seems right to man. But if it doesn't have scriptural backing and that sort of stuff does not, not as a means of working your way to heaven, the end thereof is the way of death. And so what God is saying here, the way that seems right to a man is man's own way. The way that seems right to a man is sometimes satisfying self. The way, the way that seems right to a man is sometimes doing what you want and doing things your way instead of God's way. A self-will that rejects God's guidance leads to disaster, says verse 12. 13. Even in laughter, the heart may ache and joy may end in grief. And what God is saying is that in this life, there is no such thing as pure joy. It, you just can't be, not in this life. Sorrow or pain or concern or something negative is always mixed in there with even the greatest times to some degree. That's why people use drugs and alcohol to try to forget those negative things that are there, present in our minds and our bodies even during good times. There's no such thing as pure joy in this life. The Packers win the Super Bowl. Oh, man, this is a great day. The Packers win the Super Bowl. I wish I went to have this headache. Or, or I assure him, having a good time this weekend, this is so much fun. In the back of your mind, you're thinking, I wish I wouldn't have to go to work on Monday morning. I don't like that job. You know, 
there's always something negative. Always something of concern that is mixed in there with the joy to some degree. 14. It won't be that way in eternity if you know Christ, but that's the way it is today. 14. The faithless will be fully repaid for their ways and the good man rewarded for his. In other words, there are positive consequences and negative consequences to your actions. The faithless will be fully repaid for their ways and the good man rewarded for his. If you backslide, then the consequences of your sin will bring you bitterness. On the other hand, if you're holy, you're going to be satisfied because you're going to be doing things God's way. Positive and negative consequences. Bitterness always follows disobedience. Peace and joy, satisfaction always follow obedience. Verse 15. A simple man believes anything, but a prudent man gives thought to his steps. Some people will jump on the bandwagon of every new idea or every fad that comes along simply because somebody said it. Or simply because it sure would be nice if it was true. And so people want to believe something so bad that they jump on the bandwagon. Especially these infomercials that are on, you know. Half hour, one hour spots where you got all these testimonials of how I lost all this weight and I've got these fantastic abs because I put this ab blaster on me. And I sat around and I watched television. And I put these little electrodes on and they contracted my muscle. And sure enough, look at my abs. I didn't exercise. I didn't watch my diet. I'm telling you what, this ab blaster is just a fantastic thing. How many people bought into that a couple of years ago at Christmas time? It was a fraud. It didn't work. It's the same with these pills that promise to burn fat. People want to believe in it. It sure would be nice if it worked. They are so gullible. Simply because somebody said something, so many people believe it. But a prudent man investigates carefully before he believes or he buys. That is what God says. Look at verse 16. A wise man fears the Lord and shuns evil. But a fool is hot-headed and reckless. Don't be reckless. That's the key. A fool is hot-headed and reckless. We need to be cautious. We need to pray and we need to think before we get involved in anything. Be cautious, pray, and think before you get involved in anything, before you lay down money for anything, before you make a commitment to anything. Pray prayerfully, compare it with Scripture. Be cautious. Somebody who is reckless, a non prayer, a non thinker, they may they may hit it lucky every now and then. But boy, along the way, they're going to run into a lot of brick walls. They're going to make many mistakes because of their rashness. 17. A quick-tempered man does foolish things. Boy, doesn't he ever. A quick-tempered man does foolish things, says God. Yeah, like throwing whatever is is at hand. Or like slamming the door. Or like smashing anything that will smash. Or like hanging up in somebody's ear. A quick-tempered man does foolish things. And they are stupid things. Can you imagine a guy from Mars? A guy from Mars lands here. And he observes somebody like that with a quick temper. That guy from Mars, he'd radio back home. He'd say, you know, there is life on Earth like we suspected, but it's definitely not intelligent. You ought to see these people. You ought to see what they do. You ought to see how they smash things. That belong to them. How they they hang up on what man, they are weird. We don't want to be around here, bad company, you know, corrupts good morals. Let's call off the invasion. I don't want to be around these people. Eighteen. The simple inherit folly. A simple person is a foolish person. And again, it's talking about not somebody who is mentally challenged, but somebody who is morally challenged. The simple inherit folly but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. If a a foolish person refuses sound biblical instruction, he becomes even more foolish. He inherits folly. Those who are wise enough to listen to the scriptures are rewarded with even more wisdom. And you know what God is saying here? 
He's saying that nobody ever stays the same. You are either growing more foolish or you are growing in wisdom. 19. Evil men will bow down in the presence of the good and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. And it certainly is not that way today. Evil men are not bowing down in the presence of the good unless the good are a whole lot stronger than the evil. But eventually good will triumph over evil. The Bible says, for example, that every single knee will bow before Jesus Christ. All people who in their wickedness and their love for their sin rejected Christ as Lord and Savior will go to their graves and before they are sent into the final hell they will be raised and they will be made to bow before the Lord Jesus Christ and confess that he is Lord of all evil will bow before good 20 the poor are shunned even by their neighbors but the rich have many friends ever wonder why the rich have many friends. I think you know why. Same reason the poor are shunned by even their neighbors. It's because many people form friendships on the basis of self-interest. Self-interest is why people form friendships many times. God's way would be for us to care about what we can do for people, not what we can get from people. God would have us form friendships based on that person needs a friend I think I'm going to be their friend I think I can help them not this is what I can get out of it therefore I will be their friend a lot of people even enter marriage with that idea I'm going to marry this woman I'm going to marry this man because this is what I can get out of it you got to mar- you got to enter into marriage because you love that person so much that you say to yourself this is what I can give that person this is how I can make that person's life even better Look at 21. He who despises his neighbor sins, but blessed is he who is kind to the needy. It's a sin to look down upon the needy. It's a sin to despise the poor. People shouldn't forget that Jesus came into this world as a very poor baby, born to a poor family, and he lived his entire life as a poor man. And there's no virtue in being poor. There's a lot of wealthy people who are very godly. There's no virtue in being poor. But there's no shame in it either. And they should not be despised. Look at verse 22. Do not those who plot evil go astray, but those who plan what is good find love and faithfulness. Those who plan what is good find love and faithfulness. God will repay you if you are good. And God especially appreciates it when you're good to those who are too poor to give anything to you in return. Notice the last part of verse 22 again. Those who plan what is good find love and faithfulness. If you plan good and you do good, you will also find good. But I'll tell you what, much of our happiness in this life depends on how kind we are to others. Much of our happiness in this life depends upon what kind of effort we put into making others happy, especially God. Look at 23. All hard work brings a profit. And it does. It may not seem like it, especially if you're not getting paid much. But God approves of good, honest work of any kind at any pay scale. Now, he he expects a hard-working person to be paid a fair wage. There's no question about that. Just like he expects uh, you know, a fair wage to uh, be earned by hard work. Works both ways. But even if you don't make a lot of money, if it's good, honest work, it's, a profit. it's, it's profitable for you. At the very least, you're going to learn discipline. You're going you're gonna to learn the value of doing something good, doing something worthwhile. Never forget that when you are working, you are doing God's will. Because God created man to work. Some people are looking for God's will. What is God's will for me? Are you working? Because if you are working, then for the time that you are working, you are doing God's will. 
Look at the last part of verse, or look at verse 20. Yeah, the last part of verse 23. It says, How all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Hard work pays off. But just talking about how you're going to get a job or just talking about how you're going to do this or, or how you're going to do that, that doesn't profit one bit. A lot of people do that. Many people talk about what should be done or what they would like to do, but relatively few people roll up their sleeves, get busy and do it and work at it. 24. The wealth of the wise is their crown. And whether it is spiritual wealth or material wealth, a godly person will have something to show for how they conduct themselves. Verse 24. The wealth of the wise is their crown, but the folly of fools yields folly. In other words, the foolishness of a fool yields more foolishness. And this is the old axiom, you reap what you sow. It's the law of biogenesis. Things reproduce after their own kind. And the law of biogenesis operates in the foolish. When a fool acts foolishly, well, he inherits an even more absurd, even more crazy, even more insane type of life. It just keeps building upon itself and gets worse and worse and more and more foolish. And at some point, hopefully, that person will put the brakes on. At some point, that person needs to put the brakes on and say, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to waste my life living like a fool anymore because I keep inheriting more confusion and more trouble. At some point, you need to put the brakes on and say, I'm going to start doing things God's way. At first, the first thing I'm going to do is going to receive Christ. And then I'm going to start living God's way and put a stop to this madness. 25. A truthful witness saves lives, but a false witness is deceitful. He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress. Talking about confidence. If you fear God, you're going to have a secure fortress. You're going to have confidence. And the reason you can be confident if you fear God is because you are on God's side. You are doing things God's way. And God's side always wins in the end. The Bible says if God is for us, who can be against us? Last part of verse 26. Well, let's read the whole thing. He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge, a place of safety. If you fear the Lord, you're giving your child a refuge. You're giving them a place of safety. The best thing any parent can do for a child is for that parent to have a close walk with Christ because that child will learn by example that the best place to go when times are tough is to the Lord Jesus Christ on your knees in prayer on your knees with an open Bible that is what you can give your child if you are a godly parent and that is worth much more than any fancy vacation or any fancy toys or any anything else that you could possibly give your child in the way of this world's things 27 and I stop with this the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life Turning a man from the snares of death, fearing God, drawing close to God, that will become a source of spiritual strength for you. And that will, in turn, give you the power to avoid sin.